I want to finish up the Gospel of Mark tonight because honestly, I there's so many sermons to squeeze out of this thing, but um, I want to I want to shift my focus on Sunday night somewhat and, and deal with some uh, current concerns and apologetics and and uh, and, and so bringing some lessons from. Um, uh, a creationist point of view and and, uh, and how to defend the faith on, on certain si subjects and issues. So I want to I give some attention to that and, and I want to do it relatively quickly. And so I want to, to give a summary to the final things in the book of Mark tonight. So I invite you to take with me in your Bible to turn with me to Mark chapter 14 as we begin uh, to finish this thing up here. I want to begin in verse number 27 and out of this text... Um, I want to talk about Jesus predicting Peter's denial. In verse 30, Jesus says to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And so the nighttime, you know, is, day, is darkness. And so before dawn, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And you will remember that Peter denies this. He asserts that even if all others stumble, he will not do this. And he says this. Peter got angry with Jesus in his disagreement according to Mark 14.31. Even if it means my death, I will not deny you. And of course, the rest of the disciples said the very same thing in verse number 31. But here's something that we learn from this. Number one... We learn that we are limited in our own self-knowledge. We are not omniscient. We don't know everything, and we don't know everything about ourselves. We could not possibly see ourselves doing something that wrong. Peter says, there ain't no way I would ever deny you, Lord. This is not going to happen. And, of course, he discovers that he's capable of doing something that he never planned to do and never even thought possible. There's a lot of people in prison right now who never thought it possible that they could do what they did. But it happened. And so there are limits to our self-knowledge. And I think that we need to respect that because we need to take heed lest we fall. And so the best thing that I think that we can do in this regard is to stay plugged into God's Word. It's the mirror of our soul. Hebrews 4 and verse number 12, is, it tells us that we are able to see how we really are, understand our human nature. The more that we agree with God as to the nature of human beings, the more successful that we'll become in overcoming Satan. We sing sometimes, I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. What are we doing? We're soliciting His help. Be as strong as we think we are. We need to take heed lest we fall. And then we need to know that we can become distracted from God's blessing of comfort. I want you to notice again in Mark 14, 28, how the disciples ignored Jesus' words of comfort. He spoke very plainly of His resurrection, yet they were focused on defending themselves in verses 29 through 31. Might we be guilty of the very same thing? We have been given comforting words in the Word of, in the word of God. We can enjoy comfort both from God and from one another in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we can, uh, we can overlook that comfort when we're focused on physical things and selfish things. So let's not try to work ourselves up by being distracted from Christ. Whatever it is, you can be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You need to understand there's a difference between walking in this life scared of what's going to happen versus prepared for what's going to happen. And so we need to be aware, lest we become distracted from God's comfort. We can be overconfident as well. And I think that sort of helps, that fits hand in glove with the point that we're making about the limits of self-knowledge. But you notice the self-confidence of the disciples. In Mark 14, 29 and 30 through 31, Peter angrily stated that he would die before denying the Lord. The rest of the disciples did the same thing. We might be quick to boast of our 
faithfulness to the Lord. We might be quick to boast of our faithfulness to His church. But Proverbs 16, verse number 18 tells us that things can go terribly awry. That we might deny the Lord. And so we learn a few things from this. In all this, we see God's wonderful grace, mercy, and love in, their, in His forgiveness of what the disciples had done. And so He's not going to cancel us just because we denied Him. He will accept our repentance and forgive us. Then we move to the transition. We transition over to the scene of the garden. It's really interesting to study the gardens of the Bible. There's the Garden of Eden where the fall of man takes place. But here's the Garden of Eden where a great victory takes place. And in this garden, we find that this was a place of suffering but it was also a place of great strength. Let me speak just a little bit as to the, the aspect of suffering. Remember when Jesus said, let this cup pass for me. He also prayed, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. In other words, not my will be done, but yours be done. For Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane was a place of great distress. He went to pray, accompanied only by Peter, James, and John. And before he began praying, he was troubled deeply and distressed, Mark 14, 33 says. Luke says in Luke 22, verse 44, that he was in agony and his sweat became light. There's the use of simile again. It's not that they were drops of blood, but they were light great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He was likely troubled, for he knew his hour had come, according to John chapter 12 and verse number 27, and being able to know what was going to happen, I think this is the reason why he prayed the way that he did. I would say that Jesus endured intense sorrow at this garden. Hebrews 5 and verse number 7 says that, that his prayer was heard because he was faithful. His vehement cries and tears was heard by God. His grief and his sorrow was partly due to the fact that, that he was taking upon himself our griefs and our sorrows, according to Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5. And so there was great distress, there was intense sorrow, there's also great loneliness in the garden. He wanted his closest disciples to watch and pray. And what did they wind up doing? Falling asleep. Those who were knowledgeable of his greatest miracles, those who had been with him since the very beginning of his ministry, those who saw him transformed on the mountain in Matthew uh, 17, verses 1 through 5, including the disciple of whom he loved, Peter, James, and John. All of these guys were there, yet after each episode of praying, he found them sleeping. And so this was foretold by the psalmist, Psalm 69, verse number 20 that he would be left all alone. But this garden was also a place of great strength. Jesus expressed agonizing prayer. He fell on the ground. Abba Father, let this cup pass away from me. It was godly fear that Jesus expressed for such a prayer. He was willing to accept the cup of suffering and to drink from it. Even though he didn't want to, he wanted to do the Father's will. And then we see that he was resigned to do God's will. Let this come pass. Nevertheless, thine will be done. That is a resignation. And I believe that's really where the victory was won over sin. And... and, and and the access that we have to the tree of life is now possible because Jesus made a decision to go through with it. Isn't, isn't a lot of the blessings in our life made because we made a decision somewhere down the road? And it led us to some other blessings in life. I don't think that's really where this happened. I know you could say it was the cross. and Well, it was this resurrection. And you could point to all these 
things that, that we normally point to, but I believe his decision to go through with it is very important as well. And of course, Jesus enjoyed special angelic comfort in the garden. And that is not something that we would have known anything about unless the inspired writer had said something about it. The angel had come to, to help him in Luke 22, verse number 43, strengthening him. And of course, it was also a place of renewed resolve. Jesus came there weak, but he left strong. Jesus was ready to face the hour that was at hand. He was ready to meet his betrayer and those who were with him. And so you have agony. You have Jesus resigned to do God's will and enjoying angelic comfort. And then, of course, his resolve to do what God said to do. Of course, this leads us to the next place in Scripture in verses 43 through 52, which is where Jesus is arrested in the garden. And as we think about the arrest and trial of Jesus, I want you to think about Judas for just a moment because... That's really where our focus goes when we think about his arrest. How could, how could he do that? What led him to betray his, his Lord and our Savior? How could one who had been with Jesus and seen his miracles and heard his teachings betray him with a kiss? And that's, that's what happened. What about us who claim to be Jesus' disciples today? Could we be guilty of betraying Jesus in some way? I want you to notice that when he says to the crew that are going to arrest him, whoever I kiss, he's the one, sees him, and then notice it says, lead him away safely. A little bit later, you're going to find out that uh, Judas really didn't know what all he'd done. I don't think he understood the the, the magnitude of his decision. Well, I'll notice a couple of things about Judas. One, he was a close friend. And in fact, Psalm 41 verse 9 calls him a familiar friend. He was in John 13, 1, one whom Jesus had loved. He was among those that he loved and he was one of, of Jesus' disciples. But we learn that being close to Jesus doesn't mean that we won't betray him. Uh, just like Judas, just like the churches in Asia Minor, uh, Ephesus had left their first love, Revelation 2, 4 through 5. They began to tolerate false doctrine, Revelation 2, 14 through 16. Other congregations permitted false teachers to spread their doctrines, Revelation 2, 20. What about failure to protect our works and to be watchful, Revelation 3, 1 through 3, or to become lukewarm in Revelation 3, 14 and 15. You see, all of those churches in the book of Revelation had some, most of them had some sort of problem they needed to overcome. Some sort of encouragement that they needed to hear. So just having a relationship with Jesus Christ doesn't mean that that means that we won't ever betray Him. Judas was a friend, but he was also a lover of money. He often took from the money box, John 12 says, in verses 4, 5, and 6, I believe that this opportunity made it uh, convenient for him to make a quick buck. I don't think that he ever realized exactly what he did. But it was such a problem. And we're warned about that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Those that desire to be rich drown in destruction and perdition. So I think that that is a lesson for us as well, that we not be like Jews. We don't want to be a lover of money. And then, of course, Judas betrayed Jesus with a show of affection, a kiss. Obvious to us is how contradictory his kiss was to what he was doing. But displays of affection for the Lord doesn't equate to faithfulness. And again, I would have to make the appeal, as I preach to all of us, that I preach to myself as well, that saying, I love Jesus, we can sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and deny him in so many other ways. Just realizing that our, our human limitations can make what we say and what we do oftentimes be hypocritical. And so we want to be cautious about that, at least acknowledging that it's possible that, that we can be something or that we can act in a way that we 
profess is very wrong. We need to realize our limitations in that regard. Judas betrayed Jesus and he was mistaken. How was he mistaken? Well, the consequences of his action. I mean, if you look at Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 4, evidently he didn't think that, that Jesus would be condemned. And so that's about the time when he realized what all was going... I don't think he thought he was going to die for all of this. But when he realized it, he said, I have betrayed innocent blood. I can't do this. He takes the money back and he feels very, very sorry. This has prompted some to think that Judas was motivated more by the money. That perhaps his betrayal would force Jesus to act, show his true power, maybe that in such a way it would demonstrate who Jesus really was. All of that is strictly speculation. But we can be guilty of mistaken service just like Judas was mistaken by what he was trying to do. Thinking that our service is acceptable when it's not. You think about Matthew chapter 7, verses 21, 22, and 23. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, and many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name uh, cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And he says, then I'm going to profess to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Uh, I've chewed on that verse a long time throughout ministry, and I think it's, it's interesting how, how involved one can be in the body of Christ and be so far away from the Lord come judgment day. That, that's scary, really, to think about that. And so it's really more of a check yourself kind of thing. Thinking that we can improve on God's way when His ways may not be ours. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. His ways are higher than my ways. His thinking is not my thinking. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2. We, we need to realize that we cannot presume what pleases God and offer what we think is best. We have to do it based on the Word of God. And so again, our, our limitations and our knowledge of what God really wants, we are very restricted to what the Word of God says and not to go beyond what it says. In fact, you know, in Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, Paul said, you know, my, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they would be saved. For I bear the record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. That's a powerful statement. He just indicted them and basically said they were lost. They rejected Christ, but they have a great zeal for God. It was misdirected. Is it possible that we can ever become misdirected? Well, taking a good self-inventory and a good self-check, I believe it is possible. I would say that Jesus was also, Judas was also very emotional in, in what he did. In Matthew 27, verse number 3, it says that he was overcome with grief. He, he took the wrong course of action by hanging himself. That was a very emotionally charged thing to do. His emotions were out of check. There's no place in Scripture that indicates that anybody tried to stop him. He went to his own place. Now, Jesus had said it was better if, if that man, whoever betrayed the Lord, and it turned out to be Judas, it would have been better that he'd never been born. You know, all things like that in the Scripture sort of speaks to God's omniscience and, and what he said. You know, I think about that, and, and you look at the guy in, in Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer, he was about to kill himself, but he was in, a, in the right place at the right, right time, and Paul said, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. I think that uh, God knew what the jailer could do in his kingdom. Oh, what a, what a great conversion that would make. There was a big difference, of course, in Judas and the jailer. But you think, is there ever a person anywhere else in the Bible that it says it would have been better that he'd never been born? I can't think of one. Maybe you can. And yet I, I look at the Judas situation and I think, oh man, surely his outcome could have been different. People make some snap decisions that seal their fate all the time. 
And it's very tragic what people do. I think there's a lot to learn from when we look at Judas. Then we transition into the mock trials of Jesus Christ. Jesus was arrested. He then stands before the council. There are really two trials that are going on. Uh, really six different scenes, but two different... There, there's an ecclesiastical trial, there's a civil trial. And, and under the umbrella of the ecclesiastical trial, there's three stages. The preliminary hearing before Adam, Annas in John 18. The midnight trial before Caiaphas and the council in Mark chapter 14, verses 53, and through the rest of the chapter. And then there's the morning consultation with the council there in Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 1, where it says, Immediately in the morning the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate. Then there's the civil trial. And there's also three stages of that. He stands before Pilate, the Roman governor, and then before Herod, the tetrarch over Galilee, and then he sends him back to Pilate. The ecclesiastical trial is all the religious leaders. They find him guilty, and they will look for any reason to find him guilty. And the civil trial, no one can find him guilty. They think this is an innocent man. What are these Jewish people doing? This guy's no, done no wrong. Jesus, in these trials, was falsely charged. Caiaphas, the high priest, served about 18 years, presided over the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish council, occurred at his house, by the way, in the wee hours of the morning. He's the one that in John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52, had predicted the, the crucifixion of our Lord. Really, it's kind of, I don't think he meant to be such a prophet. But in John chapter 11, verse number 53, he's thinking about Jesus and their political situation. And he says, uh, in John chapter 11, verse number 53, from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus walked no more openly uh, among the Jews, but went from there uh, into uh, the wilderness area, a city called Ephraim. It was better that um, someone should die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but that he would also gather together and warn the children of God who were scattered abroad in verse number uh, 49 through 50. Caiaphas, being a high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. And of course, it wound up being about Jesus that he was talking about. He didn't know it. So there's Caiaphas, the high priest. There's the chief priest, the elders, the scribe that were all in, the, in on the plot to kill Jesus, the members of the council or the Sanhedrin. Then you have, have to employ the use of false witnesses and Mark 14, 55, and 56. And then there's others that are present, like Peter in the courtyard, and another disciple known by the high priest. We don't know what his name is, but he's recorded in John 18, verses 15 and 16. Other servants and officers that were there. But the charges came by false witnesses. Many are said to have borne false witness, but could not agree in Mark 14, 57 through 60. Jesus they said we'll destroy the temple and build another one in three days without hands. And then in John 2, 19 through 22, another false charge misrepresenting what he taught and against which Jesus refused to defend himself. And then, of course, Caiaphas asked him, Are you the Christ? Jesus said, I am. And then he gets angry and tears his clothes as if he had just lied to him to his face. He was charged with blasphemy. And deserving of death. Of course, there was the abuse by the members of the council. They spat on him. They blindfolded him and beat him and said, Guess who's beating you now? And, and mocked him to prophesy. Then the officers struck him with the palms of their hands in verse 65 of Mark 14. That was foretold by Isaiah also in chapter 50, verse number 6. Then there's the binding of the hands of Jesus, leading him away to be crucified. Chapter 15, verse number 1. And I think about what Annie Johnson Flint wrote. Christ has no hands but our hands. Listen to this poem. 
Christ has no hands but our hands to do His work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in the way. He has no tongue but our tongue to tell men how He died. He has no help but our help to bring them to His side. We are the only Bible the careless world will read. We are the sinner's gospel. We are the scoffer's creed. We are the Lord's last message given in word and deed. What if the type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? What if our hands are busy with other work than His? What if our feet are walking where sin's allurement is? What if our tongue is speaking of things His lips would spurn? How can we hope to help Him or welcome His return? I think about this because many a great lesson has been preached by gospel preachers over the years from chapter 15, verse number 1, where they bound the hands of Jesus. And the question is always this, how do we bind the hands of Jesus? Do we bind the hands of Jesus by refusing to obey the gospel? Do we bind the hands of Jesus by uh, refusing to be transformed? Do we bind the hands of Jesus when we refuse to pray? Do we bind the hands of Jesus to do our part in the church? Do we bind the hands of Jesus by refusing to share the gospel? All of those wonderful questions about doing the will of God is a way that we can figuratively bind the hands of Jesus. And so Jesus is bound and He's, he's taken away to a place called Golgotha. And there He is mocked even more. He's mocked more by Pilate, the Roman governor, the chief priest, Barabbas, and the multitude and the soldiers. They say he perverts the nation, that he forbids to pay taxes to Caesar, that he claims to be the Christ, the King, that he stirs up the people teaching throughout Judea and Galilee. And when Pilate asked him, are you the King of the Jews? Jesus admitted it. Though his kingdom was spiritual... Still more abuse came. They scourged him and they mocked him. They put him in, uh, clothed him in purple and twisted a crown of thorns on his, and put it on his head. They saluted him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck him on the head with a reed. They spit on him and they mocked, mockingly worshipped him and they stripped him and put him, put him back in his clothes. And all that before they led him to a hill called Calvary, Golgotha, in which they nailed him into his cross. Now there was a man named Simon that is compelled to bear his cross. Golgotha is uh, outside the city of Jerusalem. It's outside the city gates. And uh, Golgotha is a modified transliteration of the Aramaic word for skull. And so therefore in your versions it will say Golgotha, the place of the skull. Calvary comes from a Latin word uh, meaning skull. So same thing. Calvary, Golgotha. He refused the narcotic wine mixed with myrrh, sometimes offered to criminals to deaden the pain of crucifixion. The doctors describe crucifixion as kind of a slow death in which uh, the muscles, having been outstretched, you know, you have to either pull up, and you have to really kind of pull and push on your feet. If your feet are nailed to the cross and your hands are nailed to the cross and your, your legs are somewhat bent, then you have, to, you have to sort of strengthen your muscles and you have to pull and sort of push at the same time. If you can imagine that excruciating pain, we were just talking this afternoon about slamming our fingers in car doors. And if you can imagine nails through your flesh, what that would be like. But the process of, of, of holding one's arms up, you, you can just try this at home sometimes. Just hold your arms out for an extended period of time and you'll feel muscles begin to ache that you probably didn't know you had. But in a position like this, it becomes difficult not so much to inhale, but to exhale. And therefore, having considered all the, the, the injuries that Jesus had sustained up to that point, and in consideration of the agony of the actual cross event, most doctors believe that, that what you wind up suffering from is congestive heart failure. That it becomes impossible for your lungs 
to breathe in such a way that they don't retain fluid. Jesus spoke seven times while on the cross. Chapter 15, verse number 34, records one of those statements. Where Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Think about all the lung power that it would require to do this. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Actually, written in Psalm 22 and verse number 1. At the foot of the cross, Mark 15, verse number 24, they divided his garments, casting lots for them. This was a prophecy of Psalm 22, verse 18. The time, the Bible says it was the third hour of the, of the day, which would have been 9 a.m. The, the inscription above it that says, This is Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, in three different languages. The two thieves, one on the right, one on the left. Now, both thieves, one of the, what we think of as the thief on the cross, actually had a change of mind along the way because at the very beginning he was just like the other one, mocking and blaspheming Jesus Christ, but then has a change of heart. Here at the cross we see the ugliness of sin, God's great love, and the motivation of Jesus' death. And Peter brings that out as a great example to live by. Someone who endured such contradiction and somebody who is so sinless and how they should live in a sinful world. If Jesus could suffer for doing no wrong, can we? And then there's this statement. I thought it was worth bringing up in 2 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, where Paul says, you know, we talk about the wisdom of God and the mystery the hidden wisdom of God which were vain before the world or before the angels of our glory, for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they really understood what they were doing, if they had really understood who Jesus was and what they were doing, doesn't that just characterize so much of our life? I mean, think about how many times that you get into the future and you change your view on this thing. You change your mind about stuff all the time. Had they known what they were doing, they would not have done it. Of course, that's exactly what we needed was for Jesus to be crucified. Paradox of the cross. And then there's his glorious resurrection. Chapter 16, verse number 6. The women find a young man there dressed in white apparel. He says to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? And of course, he was not there. Think about all the people that Jesus made an appearance to. He appeared to Mary Magdalene in chapter 16, verses 9 through 11. He appeared to other women, as revealed in Matthew's Gospel account, Matthew chapter 28, 9 and 10. To two disciples walking in the country on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 13 through 32. He appeared to Peter, Luke 24, 33. He appeared to the apostles with Thomas absent in Mark 16, 14. And then he appeared to the apostles with Thomas present, in John chapter 20, verses 26 to 31, mentioned also by Paul in his epistle to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 5. He then appeared to seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee in John 21, to 500 brethren at once, according to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 6, possibly in Galilee, to James, the Lord's brother, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, through the disciples with Another commission recorded in Luke 24 and to those present at his ascension here in Matthew or Mark 16, 19 and 20. Now why have all these witnesses? Well, there has to be witnesses to the resurrection. There has to be somebody to testify that they've seen the risen Lord. I want you to think about, uh, I want you to think about what all happened here because you have the credible witnesses it was either the biggest lie ever purported in history or the apostles and everybody that believed them were insane 
because of the things which they suffered saying that Jesus was alive. Or it was the truth. A truth that was worth dying for. A truth that caused the disciples to become apostles. You know, those guys were disciples. They were just students of Jesus Christ. But then they are described after, afterwards, after the resurrection, as being apostles. That means one who is sent. And they go on a quest to go and teach the gospel to every accountable creature on the face of this earth. Why? Why would they do that? Peter was already going to go fishing. He was going back to fishing, wasn't he? Until he heard about the resurrection. You see, once those guys knew the resurrection, it was a, it was a life-changing experience for all of them. And, and it's a life-changing experience for all of us. There are so many things that we do different because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, the gospel account ends with the ascension up into heaven, but, but I'm going to end the sermon with a great commission. Because I think that, that it's without the apostles' uh, obedience, uh, Jesus is already resurrected from the grave. They're, they're listening to Him. They're, they're about to see Him ascend to heaven when He tells them, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that who does not believe will be condemned. And, and, I, and I think that, that that's just the thing. We learn from that that we need to preach the gospel, that some will believe and some won't. But that didn't stop the apostles from going and telling them. And they were willing to do that because they'd seen the resurrected Lord. They would have been absolutely hopeless without the resurrection. Yes, it was a game changer. That, that's really the gospel of Mark in a nutshell. My question is, is it reasonable to believe they successfully propagated a lie? Too many people attest to the same fact. They were not the kind of people to fabricate such a falsehood. They lived noble lives, and all were willing to suffer and die for their testimony. And when a skeptic asked me about the resurrection of Christ, that's what I always come back with. If it never happened, how did such a lie get spread throughout all the world? And why is such a lie so effective in changing people's lives? Doesn't make any sense. It's just not possible that human beings would promote a religion based on some kind of, and this kind of religion, based on some kind of lie and then suffer for it. Doesn't make much sense at all. We're going to be talking about things like that in the next few weeks to come. We're going to be talking about the apologetics in the thing, being able to defend the faith like that. And I hope that you'll be with us on Sunday evenings for that. But for now, we have left off with the Great Commission. He said, He that believeth in his baptized shall be saved. We have one that did that today. Maybe you're here today and you need to do that tonight. Maybe you want to do the same thing. You want to obey the same gospel just like they did in the Bible. You can do that tonight. If you need the prayers of the church, we're here for you. While we stand and while we sing.